Thank you. I know it's coming to the end of the day, but um, I'll try to go straight to the cases. Here, I've got a bouquet of cases, uh, cancer by lesions, some which we use technology in a layered fashion to get us out of trouble, and the other is where we got into trouble and see how we got out of it. Uh, stop me whenever I beat my time. But uh, this is a cancer by tortuous artery with a very large diameter RCA. We see this very common, a very large voluminous RCA with tortuosity and a cancer by lesion, which is heavily cancer by lesion. Here we tried a 2.5 balloon, it wouldn't go, it wouldn't dilate. And once the balloon was inflated, it would not even cross. So we tried to use a guidezilla to assist it, and that failed as well. So our second choice was um, do we use something else? Um, and uh, we tried to use a flex stone balloon, that didn't go, so we used a rotoblader. And uh, the rotoblader was 1.5. You know the problem with the rotoblader in tortuous lesions, one of the biggest problems is a stuck burn, and uh, the other could be rupture, uh, a perforation. Anyway, once we did that, um, we did rotational attraction, we had a 1.5 uh, per 210,000 total gram in Shittagara, 450 seconds, and we used two birds. At the end of 300 seconds, we typically change the bird because the mark of the bird, the nickel, starts evaginating and then makes the bird ineffective. Um, and this is the details, we went through all this story for you. But uh, once that had happened, once we did the rotational atherectomy, uh, what next? Uh, we then went and um, uh, we, we went again with a 3.5 balloon and we found that at 18 atmospheres we just could not dilate it. And because we couldn't dilate it, we took in a IVL balloon, 4 row, and we started pulsating at 60 pulses in gave way. What happened next is important. You can see that there was a right angle bend in this artery and then we realized that a wire had exited that, the contour of the artery. The wire is outside the contour of the original artery. At this time, when we do an angiogram, you realize that there's a neolumen. This is called a neolumen. It's quite, it's not uncommon with the calcified bed lesions when we use rotational arthritis and all these tools. It cuts into the block. Our initial impression was that when we stent these neolumens, we'd be careful because uh, it could be a, a, a precursor for the perforations. So we got this opportunity to study these neolumens and we've now studied around six or seven of them with intravascular imaging. And what we found is that when we do an iris, you can see these iris images. And when, as you look at the iris images, you realize that the EL is surrounding and everything that happens is happening within the EL or the medium. That means at every image, Every image, the yellow circle is the, is the media and you can see that the figure of eight happens within the yellow circle. And because you have these iris images, you realize that we are well within the architecture of the vessel. And because we are in the vessel architecture, we don't have a hesitation of doing what is a conventional stenting. And so we did a 4.518 and a 4022 and this is, uh, this is the, uh, the case of this is a long case, it took a very, very long time. You can see the fluoroscopy, the, the cumulative AK air karma was 4.2 gray, which is, uh, which is you it took three hours for us to complete this. But uh, this is the kind of uh, final result we get. And you can see these dual lumens that are there, they're parallel lumens, and we see that often now. Uh, we had an opportunity to study this patient two and a half years after this procedure, and they still have the two lumens, and he's doing well. So, you don't have to worry about neolumens when placing a stent. This is another case which is a very complex CT of the circumflex artery. We managed to cross it uh, with a UV3 wire, but then when we got a 3O balloon there, we, at 18 atmospheres, it wouldn't expand. We also realized that when we put in a iris catheter, the iris catheter would not go beyond this one point. So, we, wherever we reached, we took an iris pullback. And these are the images. Let's look at these images. And when you look at these iris images, you look at the circular ring of calcium to the right, which is dense calcium. This is probably not the lesion which actually stopped the progression of the catheter because the nose of the catheter has gone beyond it. So something beyond it has obstructed it. <laughs> then there's non-continuous opposing plates, and then there's eccentric protruding calcium of the root of the nodule or the non-eruptive nodules. 
and those are important because we need to look at the the favorable wire position. Like this is a non-favorable wire position, that is here the wire is tucked into the lesion, which is a favorable position. When you look at the choice of devices, these are the choice of devices. And because this was a non-prosper lesion, we took a rotational arthrectomy. And when you do a rotational arthrectomy through this, like here, 1.5 word, you go through and then you repeat, and then when you repeat it, you realize that now your catheter walks in through this. We look at the iris images again and you can see that all these eccentric areas have been shaved off because you can see now the reverberations because you're smoothing the surface. But the ring has remained intact. That means the, 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 the rotor blade has just walked through it without touching it. Naturally that was the area where the balloon did not expand. So we took in an IVL balloon and with the IVL balloon when we cracked it, we realized now that the ring of calcium is now cracked over here. This means that lesion preparation, we, for this lesion preparation, we took a rotoblader, we took an MC balloon, and then we decided to go with the idea, cracked it, and once we've cracked the lesion, it's okay to just complete this, and we got a terrific result. It is now almost one and a half year out without any issue. So this is an iris which guided us to a certain algorithm for the calcified lesions and our iris has become instrumental in guiding us how to get this done. In this, in this uh, double vessel disease with calcium in the circumflex and the LED, you can see um, uh, that we had the iris going into the circumflex artery and so we quickly, based on that, we have choices to make. And in this choice, because the iris crossed the lesion, our automatic choice was to use a, you can see the cutting the lobe. In the lower image, a little distally to the circumflex, it expanded well, but proximally as you came to the left main, you can see that at 18 atmospheres, the cutting the, the, the volume does not expand. Naturally, um, when you look at the iris, you can see the iris distally, it has cracked it, approximately it has done nothing to the ring of calcium. So, this needs to be expanded, so an IVL, and you can see the IVL actually cracks that ring of calcium, so the left circumflex looks complete and ready for a stent. And we realize that the ostium of the circumflex is involved, so the stent will have to come into the left main. Now we do that, and once that is done, you can you, you realize that uh, this, is the, this is the circumflex. Now we need to enter the left anterior descending artery, but through the struts of the stent, that's what's going to happen. Here, the iris catheter doesn't want to go. And so we, in this patient, what we did is we actually separated the struts of the ostium with the trio balloon, went with an orbital atherectomy, and did an orbital atherectomy of the LAD. Once the orbital atherectomy was done, we did an orbital atherectomy of the diagonal branch, and in the diagonal branch, we used a Wolverine with a trouble balloon, and, uh, and, and in the LAD, we put in stents all the way to the left main. So I think here we used another approach where with the circumflex, because it was possible with an iris catheter, whole green ideal worked. Whereas the LED, which was non proximal we had to use an atherectomy tool like the orbital atherectomy, followed by a whole green. And in diagonals, typically, we use whole greens and then follow it with a drug looking balloon. This way we avoid a bifurcation stent. Coming to problems, when you have this kind of tortuous problem, the calcified lesions, like in this one, we did this in a live case. And we've done a CTO RCA where we used lasers and rotor and created it and then came back to do the circumflex. And you can see that once we're doing it, the circumflex now, that bird is stuck. It's a 1.5 bird and it is stuck. And it wouldn't come out. So typically we cut a balloon, we, we cut the bird, we put in a guidezilla on it after de-sleeving the, the plastic of it. And, and once we do that, it wouldn't. The traction failed to bring it back. So what do you do next? In this particular case, what we did is we left the case. This was this was this was ischemic because that whole circumflex is occluded, that whole oil branch is excluded. So we took a CTO wire and with a microcatheter close to the burr, we took a CTO wire and made a loop and actually looped it in like a star and, and, and went into that little branch, the OM branch. Once we were in the OM branch, we knew that we were now parallel to that burr. So we took in a 3O and a 3-5 balloon and at high pressure. We dislodged the bird from its impacted site, and once we dislodged it, this bird easily came out and we completed the case. So sometimes, if the bird is stuck and if you have a branch next to it, which is accommodating, you can use that branch 
with the balloon dilatation in the branch, you can dislodge the bird which is stuck and it will help you come out. And it is one way, not been described earlier, and we have actually sent it for a case report. Um, this is the last case. This is a very So this is a very complex case, MR, high pulmonary artery pressure, a very, very calcified osteal LED going into the left leg. Our plan was to put in an impeller because this was a, a, a pretty uh, high pulmonary artery pressure, very high risk for a, a pulmonary edema in these patients. And once they go there, I mean with a high end high pressure, these patients are very likely to get ventilated emergently. So we placed a 2.5 impeller for the procedure, and our plan was to do a rotoblader, left main to MED, and with an iris assessment, plan a stent strategy. So once we did that, we did a rotoblader, we went up to 1.5 and a 1.75 burr, which we normally do with this space. And once we did that, this was our iris finding. And our iris kind of from the left main, from the LED to the left main, um, and, and we did an iris from the circumflex to the left main. The osteo of the circumflex looked a little bit diseased, but we would be, our, our assessment was that we would get away with a provisional stent based on our experience. Our landing zone was around 3. Point, uh, our landing lumen was around 3 millimeters, and the left main was 4.5. So we knew that we had to stem the entire area with this as a landing zone, an eccentric calcium in between. What we did next was, based on these iris sizes, we chose, uh, and this was the circumflex osteo. We chose a, we chose, the next step was we chose an OPM 3.5 for the proximal LED and went up to 18 hours space. And this was one to one size with the LED size or the destination stem that we expected. When we did that, our plan was flawed. We had a perforation, and you can see that there is extravasation of contrast. We quickly went in and we put in covered stem and sealed that. And once we had sealed it, we, we put in two and we did a pot and we actually got a great result angiographically. We went back to see what the problem was and, and we actually got a great result. But what happened was that after that, we got, we, we realized that this continues to extravasate even after putting stents inside. So when we realized that even after stenting it, it continued to ooze into the pericardium, we put in Joe crabs and sealed the perforation. And this is where we realized that we had sealed it and we saw no more extravasation at this time. But we did an echo. And look at the hemodynamics. This patient had started with a blood pressure of 170 by 84, pulmonary artery pressures were high. And as he puffed, you can see that all his pressures are dropping. And at, at completion, heart rate was 190, uh, her blood pressure of 110. This is something that tells us that there is a tamponade and the echo kind of corroborates that. So when that echo shows that, we thought let's do a, decided to put a pericardial drain. The pericardial drain is done typically in lateral, under ultrasound vision and everything, like standard procedure. And once we did that, we, we, had, we had hemodynamic recognizance of our blood pressure coming to 1870. 45 minutes later, 4 liters aspirated and the patient continued to be aspirating. He, he continued to have a bleed in there. We were not sure what it was. We had, no, we had, no, we had nothing else to contribute. The coronaries look without any perfection. So we were wondering what had happened. We tried to put in a finger through that to see if we could seal it, but that wouldn't work. We tried to increase the window, put in a bigger 10 French, that wouldn't work. It kept on, 4 liters down, aspirating. We were compelled. What we ended up doing next was, was crazy. Um, I, I went and I sliced the skin on this thing I, and I took in a saw from my surgeon and I stripped open the sternum and did a sternotomy in the cat lab. When we did a sternotomy in the cat lab, the pericardial space was, was, ext was uh, uh, we, we relieved the pericardial space and the blood pressures came up. And what you can see in the next picture there, that really well, but you can see my finger going and touching that RV which had perforated. So the question is, how did the RV wall perforate? So the RV wall perforated because in that hemodynamic consequence, with the moving heart in the pericardial space, when I was doing the pericardial synthesis, I licked the RV inadvertently, and I think this is something important. So before we close the chest, we, we once we had it all okay. By then, my surgeon had arrived. 
and he, he and he kind of cleaned up the whole thing, and and um, we we realized that the corollaries were good, so we decided not to draft it. But the problem was the mistake was in the decision of the OPN sizing. If you look at these iris images, we did a 3.5 stent uh, balloon here because it was a 3.5. But when you have an eccentric calcium with a normal segment on one side, undersize your balloons, and that's the message. Um, we, we should have undersized this balloon, but we were able to save this patient, salvage her, and send her home on day eight with this. Um, thank you for this, but uh, this is those four weddings and funerals sometimes that we have to attend in the cat lab. Thank you.